Well, we continue today in our series, and we'll be reading out of 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 6 through 16. <clears throat> As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated, Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very angry and this saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands and to me they have ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day on. The next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul, and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre, as he did day by day. Saul had a spear in his hand, and Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall, but David evaded him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. So Saul removed from him removed him from his presence and made him a commander of a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David had success in all his undertakings, for the Lord was with him. And when, he saw, when, when Saul saw that he had great success, he stood in fearful awe of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, for he went out and came in before them. This is the word of God. Would you pray with me? Well, God, we give you great thanks for the word that you have preserved for us without error, that has brought courage and hope and peace and joy to people throughout all generations. I pray that we'd be a people eager to hear the word today, that we would be a people that don't just ask for more information, but we seek transformation, that we are eager for the Spirit to do the work in us, I pray for Pastor Trent, God, that you would give him great courage and joy in preaching. I pray that you would protect him and his family from the enemy, that it would be a great delight to help to shepherd the church that you have given to us. We ask all of this in Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. We see a deadly sin on every street corner, in every home, and we tolerate it. We tolerate it morning, noon, and night. Well, not anymore. It started at a worship service, two brothers going up to offer their worship to the one true God. And it ended in a field with one brother lying dead in the grass at the hands of the other brother. What is it that takes a person so quickly from worshiping God one moment to murdering their brother in cold blood the next? How does one get from that place to the other? Perhaps the shortest path is called envy. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter four the story of Cain and Abel, two brothers who had gone up to bring their offerings to God. And what the Bible tells us is that God accepted Abel and his offering, but Cain and his offering he rejected. Cain was filled with envy and he was filled with anger. And God said to him, if you do what is right and good, will you not be accepted? But for Cain, more important than him getting something good for himself was taking something good from his brother. And so rather than repenting and enjoying the favor and the blessing of God, instead, Cain kills his brother and removes it from him. Such is the power of envy. What is envy, anyway? Envy is a feeling of unhappiness at someone else's good fortune. Webster defines it 
in this way, that envy is a sense of discontent and resentment over another's advantages, possessions, or attainments. Perhaps that's helpful definitions, but maybe you get a better sense of what it is as we talk about what it actually feels like. Envy is what you feel when that person you graduated from school with gets invited back for some honorary award when their career really was pretty lackluster compared to your own. That's envy. Envy is that feeling you have when you're a mom and you've got kids and there's another mom, a similar age and stage with kids and, and, and people start to praise and acknowledge how good of a mom that one is while you are left, well, just doing all the difficult things of a mom without any recognition whatsoever. That's envy is that feeling. Envy is that feeling you have when the couple who seems to have it all together and they're just annoyingly beautiful and wonderful and nice it's that good feeling you get when you find out they're getting a divorce. That's envy. Envy is why you can't sleep for days, maybe weeks, maybe years when the jerk down the hall gets advanced to the position you deserve and you don't get it yourself. That's what envy feels like. That's the that's the 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 feeling, the sin we're talking about today as we continue in this series on the seven deadly sins. Now, envy, as you maybe know from those examples or as you recall it in your own life, envy is a sin that tends to eat us up from the inside out. In fact, the book of Proverbs describes, I think, best what envy actually does to us when it says that envy makes the bones rot. That's what it feels like when you're being eaten up with envy is, is your bones are, are rotting. You're becoming increasingly weak. You're ultimately being destroyed. That's what envy does to you. It destroys you. Now, envy is often confused with its closely related cousins, perhaps most commonly confused with jealousy. And envy and jealousy do share some similarities, but they are not the same, though we often use the two words simultaneously. Here's a distinction between envy and jealousy. Jealousy makes us fear to lose what we possess, while envy creates sorrow that others have what we have not. So jealousy is the fear of losing something you have. Envy is a feeling of sorrow that somebody else has something you don't have. Jealousy, by the way, is not all bad. God describes himself as being jealous. There are appropriate contexts for desiring to have what is rightfully yours. In the case of the Bible, God is jealous for the hearts of his people that rightfully belong to him. A husband or wife is rightly jealous for the heart of their spouse. There are right applications for jealousy, though it can also become sinful. Envy, on the other hand, has no rightful application. It is sin. Envy is also oftentimes confused with coveting, but it share some similarities, and often where you have one, you have the other, but they are not to be identified as the same. Here's a distinction for you. What an envier wants is not, in, first of all, what another has. What an envier wants is for another not to have it. To covet is to want somebody else's good so much that you're tempted to steal it. To envy is to resent somebody else's good so much that you're tempted to destroy it. So herein is the difference. You want what somebody else has to the point that you're tempted to take it, or you resent that they have it so much that you're tempted to destroy it, or another step further, to destroy them. And that's ultimately where envy ends. We've talked about these seven deadly sins as not necessarily being more deadly than any other sins, at least not spiritually speaking. The wages of every sin is ultimately death. But when it comes to physical death, envy might just lead the way because it does ultimately end in the, the aim of destruction of its object. As we look at our text today, we're gonna see that for King Saul, there are traces of jealousy in his heart. There are traces of of covetousness, but the primary sin that's working and eating away at him is the sin of envy, and ultimately leads him to seek to destroy his rival, David. 
Now, you might be saying to yourself today, well, I haven't tried to kill anybody, therefore envy's not really an issue for me. And it's true that envy does ultimately end up taken to its natural conclusion in the destruction of its object, but, but envy actually starts way sooner than that. Here are some other symptoms that envy might be at work in your heart. Uh, envy can be that you're feeling offended at the success, the talents, or the good fortune of other people. That's a sign of envy at work in you. Um, selfish or unnecessary rivalry or competition. Pleasure at others' difficulties or distress. Reading false motives into others' behavior. Belittling others. That can manifest itself also in this way. You see a group of people, they're all saying really nice things about this other person who's not present. And you just feel compelled to share with them a piece of information you know about that person that may help, to not look, may help them look a little less shiny than they do. You just feel compelled. That you need to know this about them just so you have the full picture, right? That's envy that's at work there. Envy also can be manifested in the desire to initiate or to help pass along gossip related to just what we've just seen. So all of these are symptoms of envy. Of course, there are many more besides, but this particular sin eats us up from the inside out, and it's quite miserable, as we'll see. So what we want to look at this morning is the roots of envy, the fruits of envy, and then, thank God, the cure for envy. Let's start with the roots of envy. Now, sin, envy, and every other sin is not content just to rest in our hearts and keep, it, keep to itself. Right? Envy, like every other sin, grows and it spreads and it bears fruit if it's not put to death. So, Envy does that as well. But what is the real source of our envy? When you're feeling envious, it can feel like the real problem is the object of your envy. It can feel like it's that person, like it's your rival that is the reason why you're feeling the way you do. It can feel like it's your, your boss who doesn't recognize how much of a fool that person is they just promoted, and that's the reason why you feel the way they do. It, it, can, it can feel like it's because the whole world is against you that you feel like what you do. But, but the problem of envy is not a problem external to you. It's not a problem of your circumstances. It's a problem of your heart. Jesus tells us this plainly in, Matthew, in Mark 7. He says, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within... Out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, adultery, murder, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these things come from within, and they defile a person. So your circumstances are never the reason for your sin. Your circumstances just expose the sin that's already in your heart. So this is not something we can put on somebody else. This is not something we can blame another person for why we feel the way we do. It's our own heart that has created this envy and sin at work within us. So what are the roots of it? Where does envy find good soil in which to take root and grow? The first place is in comparison. Envy thrives on comparison. And in fact, without comparison, envy has no life whatsoever. Envy feeds on comparison. In our text, I want to give you a little bit of a background information because we're just parachuting here into 1 Samuel 18 and you're not aware of the story. But Saul is the king of Israel. And up to this point, he has been the greatest hero and greatest king in Israel's history because he's the first one. And into that situation comes this young upstart named David. Now, Saul was off to a decent start, but he went astray, and he didn't follow the Lord wholeheartedly. He, he went headlong into sin and had essentially a pattern of sin, 
And so God says to Saul, the king, through the prophet, a couple chapters before this, he says these words. The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. Talk about comparison, right? When God says to you that somebody is better than you, it's hard not to compare yourself. At the same time, when God says that somebody's better than you, the right answer is not to try to show God why you're actually better, but actually just to say, you're right, they're better. What becomes clear as we follow the story of 1 Samuel 18 is that the neighbor better than Saul that God is going to give the kingdom to is this young King David. Now, right before this passage we read this morning, David has just taken down with a sling and a stone the great Philistine champion named Goliath, the giant that had all of Israel cowering for a very long time until David stepped up and said, I have taken him for the glory of God, and he kills him. And now they're coming back, and we pick up in verse 6. As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. All good so far. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated. Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Now when you read that song, I hope it's immediately apparent to you that this is a dumb song. <laughs> you should never sing this song to the king about the king and the young upstart who appears to be taking his place. There is one person in a billion on planet Earth who could hear this song and not be offended and angry and hurt and ultimately envious. But this is the song that they sing. And Saul, with the help of these companions, compares himself to David. And how does he feel about this? Verse 8. Saul was very angry. Can you imagine that? It's hard to imagine somebody getting angry about that. Saul was very angry, and this saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And David and Saul eyed David from that day forward. Comparison. Sometimes other people help you make those comparisons, don't they? You're pretty good. Have you heard so and so? Wow. Or you, you, don't they look really nice in that outfit they're wearing today? Other people sometimes help us make comparisons. Sometimes we make them ourselves, but the effect is when we see the comparison unfavorably that it displeases us and we get angry. Saul gets angry when he hears about this comparison and it says from that day on, he eyes David. It's not a positive statement. He's not looking at him with an eye of delight or favor. He's looking at him with the eye of envy. And what's amazing is just a couple of chapters before this, in chapter 16, verse 21, we read that Saul loved David greatly. He saw what David was. He saw his gifts, he, and he delighted in him. He loved him. But now, things have changed. You see, we don't tend to compare ourselves to people who are way higher than us or way lower than us. We tend to compare ourselves to people that we think are pretty similar. Before, David was just a lowly shepherd boy who had some musical talent, and, and Saul loved him. But now, suddenly, he's a a rival hero. It was David who struck down Goliath and won the hearts of the people, not Saul. And so Saul sees him differently. He sees him as someone to compete with, to compare himself with, and that the women have helpfully pointed out to him, he doesn't compare very favorably with. And so he's angry. We happen to live in a time where comparison has become easier than ever. It used to be, it was only every 10 years or so that you could find out how your classmates were doing relative to you when you go back for the reunion. Now, through social media, you can see it every day. 
And you can see how all of your rivals are doing, all of the people that you compare yourself with. And, and they can present the very best pictures of themselves and the very, very best uh, slant on their life. And you can compare yourself to their very best. And when that happens, of course, you find yourself not measuring up very well and you find envy finding a, a happy place to live inside your heart. Social media is not the problem, by the way. It's just exposing the problem. But it is a ripe place for envy to take root in our hearts. Comparison is where envy begins. Where there's no comparison, there's no envy. The second root of envy is coveting. We've already made a distinction between coveting and envy. But coveting is often involved with envy. In fact, here's how Cornelius Plantinga puts it. He says, an envier may begin by hankering for somebody else's goods, covetousness. But failed covetousness is likely to curdle into envy. The envier is often a disgruntled coveter. So Saul wants God's favor. He wants the love of the people that David has, but he feels like he can't have it anymore. God's already told him the kingdom is taken away. It doesn't lead him to repentance, but rather his failed covetousness now leads him to envy where feeling like he can't get it himself, his next aim is to try to keep David from having it. Pay attention to what your heart is coveting because that is likely the place where envy is going to find a, a home in your heart, covetousness. The third piece is self-loathing, self-loathing. Very few people ever admit to or confess that they are envious. And the reason why we don't confess this sin is not because we don't have it, but because when you acknowledge that you are envious of somebody, you're making a confession that you actually think they are better than you. To, to be envious of somebody is to make the the subtle confession that they are more successful than you are, that they're better off financially than you are, that they're more gifted than you are, that they're more talented, that they look better, that they dress better. It, it's to, you're making that acknowledgement and we're not ready to make that acknowledgement. But what we then end up doing is we end up despising ourselves. We see what they have that we don't. We don't want them to have it, but we also despise ourselves for not having it or being it. And envy finds a fertile home in the heart that loathes itself. Rebecca DeYoung writes, the envious care how they stack up against others because they measure themselves and their self-worth comparatively. So they always have to, they always have to compare themselves because that's where they get their worth from. Either I'm better or I'm not as good. Envy depends on a sense of inferiority and a lack of self-love. So think for a moment about your own life and ask yourself the question, where am I tempted to compare myself to others? Where am I tempted to compare my family? Where am I tempted to compare my career and so on? And who am I tempted to compare myself with? Take note of those things, pay attention to those things because that's where envy is going to make its way known. Where do you covet what another has? Pay attention to that because there you're susceptible to envy. Where do you find yourself not liking yourself? Being unhappy with how you are, where you are, what you are. Watch out, because that's a place for envy to get a hold of you. These are the roots of envy, at least three of the roots. Let's talk about the fruits, because envy's not content to just sit there. It's going to bear fruit, it's gonna grow in your life. And the first fruit of envy we see is that of anger. Anger, verse eight. After Saul hears this song and himself compared unfavorably, it says, Saul was very angry and this saying displeased him. Now you can imagine, he hears the song, he plays it over in his head. You know, he's marching into town, he's feeling good. He hears the people singing, it's all great. And then he picks out the words. And he hears what they're saying, and suddenly he maybe keeps on this fake plastic smile, but he begins to seethe inside. How dare they sing this? And who is this David guy? He's not all that great. Sure, he got lucky one time with a rock and a sling, but how dare he think he can usurp my place? And these foolish people think he's greater than I am. And he goes home with it. 
And he doesn't leave it on the nail hanging outside his house. He brings it inside and he, he lives with it. And he plays it over and over in his mind and he keeps hearing it and it makes him more and more angry and he can't sleep that night and he's tossing and turning on his bed because these people just don't get it. They just don't know. And then we read how the next day goes, verse 10. The next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre as he did day by day. By the way, as if it's not enough that David took out Goliath, that he's a brave warrior, that he's young, that he's good looking, the guy can play the lyre like nobody's business, he writes great songs and he sings. And Saul's just like everything about the guy, he just hates him now. Everything about him hates him. So while he's sitting there watching him play the lyre, which was his job to help Saul be cool, Saul had a spear in his hand. And Saul hurled the spear for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. Twice. You'd like to think about yourself that you would only have to evade somebody one time that you would never be near enough close again for them to take a second shot. But David, such was his love for Saul and his commitment and his loyalty to Saul, sticks around after the first spear chuck and evades him a second time. Saul's angry. He's angry and he's fearful. Because Saul recognizes that God's favor is with David in a way that it is no longer with him. And whereas you would think that David is the one who becomes afraid, having been tempted shish kebab twice, it's Saul who becomes fearful. Now, Saul's anger is obviously directed at David, but it goes deeper than that. You see, to be envious of another not only is to be angry that somebody else has something, but it's to be angry at the God who's given it to them. Saul is angry at God for David's privileged position. He may not even be aware of it, but he is. Ultimately, envy betrays our dissatisfaction with and anger toward God. You cannot be envious of another and at peace with God because you're ultimately not satisfied with what he's given you and you believe he has failed you and he has not provided or given as he should. And we get angry. The next fruit of envy is misery. Looking down at verse 12 and following, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him but had departed from Saul. Talk about misery, becoming aware of that fact. So Saul removed him from his presence and made him a commander of a thousand. Not believing God to be in control of the situation or not believing God to be good, Saul aims to try to control it himself and becomes even more miserable now trying to orchestrate things. And he went out, David went out and came in before the people. And David had success in all his undertakings for the Lord was with him. And when Saul saw that he had great success, he stood in fearful all of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David for he went out and came in before them. It's like over and over and over again, we find out how favored David is, how good things are going for David and how bad it's going for Saul. It just keeps getting worse and worse. Not good, he is miserable. This is the nature of envy. There is no pleasure in it. When you think about the other deadly sins that we're looking at in this series, each of them have some element of pleasure, at least initially. It can feel really good to get angry and fly off the handle at somebody and vent, for a little bit anyway. There's a certain pleasure in that. It's, the consequences come later, of course, but for a moment at least, it, it feels good. Likewise with lust and with gluttony, there's a certain initial pleasure at least and then the consequences come later, but that's not the case with envy. Joseph Epstein writes, of all the deadly sins, only envy is no fun at all. It is miserable from the beginning. It's an awful feeling, but rather than dealing with the feeling and dealing with the sin as the Bible would call us to do, instead, we're miserable and our, our hope of redemption is to make somebody else more miserable than we are. That's what, that's what envy does. There's a 
story told by Victor Hugo about greed and envy. And greed and envy were both given the opportunity to ask for anything they wished, and it was promised that they would receive whatever they asked for. The only condition was, whatever greed or envy asked for, the other one got a double portion. So envy thinks about what it wants the most and decides what to ask for. I wish to be blind in one eye, knowing that greed gets a double portion. Right? That's how envy works. It's miserable, and its aim is to make somebody else even more miserable. The third fruit of envy is murderous insanity, for lack of a better word. Murderous insanity. We've already seen Saul after he's sitting there, he's watching David, he's just hating him while he sees him being David, and he takes his spear and he tries to kill him twice, unsuccessfully, he realizes the hand of God's favor is upon him, and not only that, but people love David, and it's not gonna look good for him to kill David, so he comes up with this murderously insane plan to get the Philistines to kill David so that he can look like David's friend while knocking David off. So the plan is to get his daughter to marry him so that he looks good, and then send him into harm's way so he looks dead. Verse 17, then Saul said to David, here's my elder daughter Merab. I will give her to you for a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. This is what he was thinking. Let not my hand be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. He's willing to marry off his daughter and make her a widow to satisfy his envious hatred. One commentator writes, nothing shows a wickeder heart than being willing to involve another, and especially one's own child, in a lifelong sorrow in order to gratify some feeling of one's own. To involve another person, to make your own daughter's life miserable because you so desperately want to make your enemy's life even more miserable, It's more wicked than this. This is what envy does. It leads people to treat their children in this way. You see this scene playing out in many different ways. Well, in any case, Merab is not given to David. She's given to another. Perhaps Saul was aiming to dig a knife into David's heart. We're not told the reason. But she was given to someone else. But someone brings to Saul's attention that he has another daughter. Verse 20. Now Saul's daughter, Michal, loved David, and they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. Saul thought, let me give her to him, that she may be a snare for him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. So the next iteration of his murderously insane plot is to give his second daughter, who it sounds like is an idolater. And he wants to give her to David because he thinks that maybe she will lead him astray from the one true God to worship false gods so that the hand of God's favor won't be on David anymore and so that David can finally get killed by the Philistines. And not only that, but all he asks for a bride price is not money. Just bring me 100 Philistine foreskins. What could go wrong? David does, and he brings him not only 100, but 200. But perhaps Saul's thought is, when the Philistines come and discover the mutilated bodies of their countrymen, they're gonna really want to kill David. And of course they do, and as the story goes on, we find out the Lord keeps giving David success, and he just becomes a bigger and bigger hero. And the more Saul hates him, and the more Saul wants him dead, the more successful and fruitful and everything good David becomes. This is, again, the power of envy. He's seeking to destroy David and ends up doing damage to his daughters, ultimately to himself. That's how envy works. Billy Graham tells a story about uh, an ancient Greek story about a couple of athletes, and they were both great athletes, but the town wanted to honor one of them, and so they built a statue to honor this great competitor in their town. 
And the rival sees the statue and, of course, understandably, begins to get eaten away out with envy. So every night, he goes out with a hammer and a chisel, and he chisels away at that statue, aiming to ultimately weaken it enough to where it will fall down. And one night, it does fall down, right on top of the chiseler. And that's what envy does. We, it, it leads us to try to destroy someone else, and in the process, we end up destroying ourselves. It's a miserable condition. I don't think I have to convince you that being envious is miserable. There are some sins that we have to be convinced away from and try to point out to you why this is so bad. I think you get it with envy. It's a miserable condition, and thank God there is a cure for envy. You don't have to be a slave to those terrible feelings and those murderously insane thoughts and the misery. There's a cure. In fact, it's threefold at least. The first piece of that cure is called gratitude. You see, if envy thrives in a heart that is ungrateful, covetous, then it begins to wither in a heart that's filled with gratitude. See, when we envy, we get caught up on what someone else has that we don't have, and, and we really want them not to have it. But that's not what's happening in the grateful heart. The grateful heart isn't so much concerned with what others have that they don't have. The grateful heart is con caught up with what they have that they don't deserve. Rick Warren says, envy is resenting God's goodness to others and ignoring God's goodness to me. We get so caught up in seeing what others have, how they're praised, how they're better than us, or how we think they're better than us, and we become increasingly blind to the blessings God's placed in our own life. And what a grateful heart does is it actually counts God's blessings. It actually looks at its life and it considers all that it has and it says thank you to God for each and every one of them. The envious heart believes it deserves more than what it's getting. The grateful heart is thankful for what it has knowing that all it deserves is death and hell. The Bible says that to us, not in as many words, but as you read across the pages, what you discover is you don't deserve anything from God. The only thing you deserve from him is to die and to go to hell. And if you get anything else than that, it is purely God's grace to you and his grace to me. And the grateful heart recognizes that, and it recognizes the little blessings and the small things, and it's, it's not caught up with what it doesn't have. It's caught up in a maze that it has anything whatsoever that's good because it knows what it deserves. Gratitude begins to wither envy in the heart. Secondly, contentment. Contentment, being satisfied with what you have. If, if envy thrives on covetousness, then contentment begins to wither that root as well. When you consider what the Bible says about you, if you're a Christian, when you consider what the Bible says about you, that by faith in Jesus, you've become God's child that by faith in Jesus, you've been promised an inheritance better than anything in this world that could offer, an inheritance that doesn't ever fade, it won't ever perish, it, it will last forever, you won't ever run out of it. You've been promised that you have a peace with God and a relationship with him, that God had actually, God himself actually comes and takes up residence in your life. That there's nothing in this world that can possibly happen to you that won't ultimately turn out for your good that God himself will be for you. When, you. when you know that all of these things are yours, you find there a power to be content when you're tempted to be covetous. And you look at what that other person has and you start to feel this rise up in you, oh, I can't believe what I don't have and that they do have. And then you remember what you actually have and who you actually are in Jesus. And, and the effect is it begins to wither the root of covetousness and we become content with what we have. The reason why we become envious is because we forget what God has given to us in giving us Jesus. 
So the key to contentment is ultimately this personal relationship with Jesus. And having been given all in him, we don't worry so much that this other person looks a little better than I do, that they're a little smarter than me, that they're a little more gifted than me, that they got more money than me, that they take better vacations than me. Than they. We don't worry about those things because we realize that what they've been given, they've been given from the hand of a God who is all-knowing and wise and powerful and loving and good. And what we've been given has come from the hand of the very same Father who loves us. And so when we don't have as much, we don't have to worry that he doesn't love me as much. He has proven his love for you once and for all when he gave Jesus at the cross. It is the ultimate demonstration of his love. You cannot question his love when someone else has something better than you. It's because of love. It's because of love. Do you trust him? When you trust him, you will find contentment. Paul says, I've learned in whatever situation I'm in to be content, for I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It is in this relationship with Christ and knowing who you are in Christ, and knowing what you've been given in Christ, that you will find the strength to be content in whatever situation God places you in. The third piece, then, is love. The Bible tells us that love does not envy. It's the polar opposite of love. You see, because envy is sorrowful at somebody else's good. What is love? Love is rejoicing at someone else's good. And love not only rejoices in someone else's good, but love actually takes active steps and sacrificial steps to see to it that someone else experiences good. Where there is love, there can be no envy. We have difficulty when people get things that we don't feel like they deserve and maybe we feel like we deserve it more. Consider how different the heart of Jesus is. The Bible tells us that Jesus actually loves to give his people what they don't deserve. It doesn't bother him to see people get what they don't deserve. In fact, Jesus gave his life on a cross so that you, his enemies, could receive what you don't deserve. That's the polar opposite of envy. That is love. Jesus comes, having been sent by the Father who loved us, and he comes to a cross to bear a penalty he didn't deserve, a judgment he didn't deserve. The very guilt and the shame of our envy, he took it in himself that he didn't deserve, so that we who didn't deserve anything could receive the blessings that he himself deserved. So far as he from being bothered that we get what we don't deserve, he gave his life that we could have what we don't deserve. That's love. And you'll know that the gospel has started to take root in your heart when you likewise can move from not only not envying people, but moving to actually loving people and actually wanting your rivals to succeed, actually begin rooting for your rivals, and then maybe even taking sacrificial steps to see to it that they succeed even more. The gospel has that kind of power when we believe it, through a relationship with Jesus Christ to change us into those kind of people. If Saul is a picture of envy, then Saul's son, Jonathan, is a picture of its opposite, a picture of love. We didn't read these verses, but they're at the beginning of chapter 18. Saul felt threatened by David, but he really didn't have reason to be threatened by David. David was totally loyal and committed to him. Jonathan, on the other hand, Saul's son, is the next in line for the kingship. He has every reason to be threatened by David and to want to wipe him out as a rival, but he doesn't. The text tells us multiple times that Jonathan loved David as he loved his own soul. 
And so as David begins to rise in ascendancy and begin to experience success, Jonathan could have gotten envious, but he didn't. He loved more. And what the text tells us is that Jonathan actually takes his own royal robes off himself and puts them on David. Can you imagine? He takes his armor and his sword and he puts it in David's hands. You see, for Jonathan, David's success is not a threat to Jonathan's joy. David's success completes Jonathan's joy because he loves him. And do you think that Jonathan was any less miserable because he defended David, because he advocated for David, because he he helped David succeed? Do you think he was any less joyful for having done that or watching David succeed and become the king after God's own heart? Did Jonathan experience deeper joy than he ever could have experienced had he been a rival and an envious one? Brothers and sisters, when the gospel gets a hold of our hearts, we will find ourselves increasingly desiring good for all people. Because when the gospel gets a hold of our hearts, we will increasingly love all people, all kinds of people, and we want to see good happen to them. And we will actively begin working for the good of others, even at personal cost to ourselves, in the very same way that our God has loved us in Jesus Christ. I want you to think for a moment about that person you're tempted to envy, that rival, that one you already do envy. I want you to think about that person for a moment. I want you to think about what you've been given in Christ Jesus, gratitude, contentment, love, how God has loved you. And I want you to to pray, or at least to ask God to help you to pray and mean it from your heart. This prayer from Charles Spurgeon, it goes like this. Give me such a love to my fellow creatures that I can rejoice in their joy. And the more they have, the more glad I am of it. My candle will burn no less brightly because theirs outshines it. I can rejoice in their prosperity. Then am I happy for all around tends to make me blissful when I can rejoice in the joys of others and make their gladness my own. Envy tells you that you will be happy if you can just ruin that other person. But what the gospel says and what love says is that you'll have your deepest joy when you help others experience their deepest joy through love. Would you join me as we pray that God will do that work in us? Father, we thank you that though we were your enemies, who deserved only death and hell. You came and gave us what we didn't deserve. You gave us Jesus. And we thank you that through simple faith in him, every one of us can share in the blessings of his obedience and his love. I pray for any who don't know you here this morning and who are shackled in the chains of envy, that you will set them free as they put their trust in you and experience your love for the first time. And for those of us who do know you, but who have forgotten to be grateful, who have forgotten to give thanks in all circumstances, who have forgotten that through Jesus we can be content in any circumstance, who have forgotten what love is, I pray, Lord, that you will free us again this morning from these chains we put back on ourselves. Free us from the miseries of envy and set us free to enjoy our position as children of God, dearly loved and called to love. We pray this, not only that we might be happy, but we pray it above all else that you might be glorified in and through us. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.